Affordable energy not only fuels our vehicles and electrical plants, it also fuels our economy and our quality of life. But there is a problem. Today's energy technologies release excess carbon dioxide to the environment. There is growing concern that this excess carbon dioxide in the atmosphere might affect climate and weather. Can we control the amount of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases that humans release to the atmosphere and still provide affordable energy? Funding provided by the U.S. Department of Energy, the National Energy Technology Laboratory, members of the Energy and Environmental Research Center's Plain CO2 Reduction Partnership, and the members of Prairie Public. Carbon dioxide is a colorless, odorless gas that is made up of one atom of carbon and two atoms of oxygen. The chemical formula for carbon dioxide is CO2. Whether we're aware of it or not, we come in contact with CO2 every day, when we breathe and to make our soft drinks bubble and fizz. A small amount of CO2 is naturally present in the atmosphere. Plants take in carbon dioxide for photosynthesis. After the plant dies and begins to decay or burns, some of the carbon is returned to the atmosphere as CO2. CO2 in the atmosphere also plays another important role. Like water vapor and methane, CO2 is a greenhouse gas and is important in the natural process known as the greenhouse effect. The greenhouse effect is simply the understanding that we have that carbon dioxide and other gases in the atmosphere do trap heat. Those components of the atmosphere create a blanket, if you will, around the earth that traps heat and creates the stable conditions that we have that can support life on earth. Without that warming of the greenhouse effect and the gases that cause it, life as we know it would not exist here. The level of CO2 in the atmosphere varies. Over the past half million years, low levels of atmospheric CO2 have corresponded to glacial periods and high levels to warm periods. Until the mid-1800s, the human contribution of CO2 to the atmosphere was very small and came from two practices, plowing the land and burning wood and dung for heat. But by the middle of the 1800s, humans changed the way they used resources the Industrial Revolution began. Our society, particularly in the Western world, changed dramatically. We moved from a society which was largely agrarian uh, to a society which was more and more urban. The quality of life improved dramatically. Opportunities for people from all ranges of life were enhanced. But the one thing I think we, we forgot about in that whole equation was uh, there is no free lunch. Quality of life has, has significantly improved but it's all based on a cornerstone of tremendous use of natural uh, energy resource. Better energy sources were needed to fuel trains and automobiles and provide energy to generate electricity and heat homes and businesses. We humans turned from energy poor fuels like wood and animal droppings and came to depend on energy rich fossil fuels. Anytime you use a fossil fuel, and by fossil fuels we're talking about coal, oil, and natural gas, they contain something called carbon. And when you burn these fuels, you create carbon dioxide. And carbon dioxide is a potent greenhouse gas in the atmosphere. CO2 is part of the stack emissions of large stationary sources like power plants and factories. CO2 also comes out of the chimneys of homes and commercial buildings. And CO2 is present in the exhaust of our cars, trucks, boats, airplanes, and even lawnmowers and snowmobiles. Beyond these sources, land use practices like plowing, draining wetlands, and deforestation have contributed significant amounts of CO2 to the atmosphere. Fossil fuel use has increased dramatically in the industrialized world since 1850. During that same period, the level of CO2 in the atmosphere has increased by 
and the atmosphere has warmed a little over one degree Fahrenheit. Climate and weather are fueled by heat in the atmosphere. More CO2 in the atmosphere means more heat energy. This additional heat energy could cause disruptions in global climate patterns and an increase in severe weather. Global warming is the notion that we are pushing the greenhouse effect in a certain direction. We're adding too much of the gases that cause the greenhouse effect. It's like throwing on too many blankets at night. You know, one blanket's good, three blankets are not so good. At the most basic level, energy is essential, but it has to be affordable. The lack of affordable energy means that people can't clean up their water, they can't have good medical care, they can't distribute goods and services properly, and so that's very, very important. But we also need to have affordable energy with respect to the environment. There needs to be a balance between energy and the environment, so our growing global need for energy presents a challenge. Fossil fuels are plentiful and affordable, and they're the cornerstone of the world energy picture today. And they're going to be important, they're going to continue to be important for many, many years to come. Especially when one starts to think about countries like China and India, which have very rapidly developing economies, and their needs for energy are going to grow for many decades to come. So we need to develop technologies that reduce the amount of CO2 that humans are putting into the atmosphere. Can we control CO2 and still keep the cost of energy low enough to continue to fuel economic growth and a rising global standard of living? there'll have to be a balance uh, between environmental and economic concerns. Um, I mean, we need economic growth and economic prosperity. You know, we all need jobs to earn a living. Uh, if we can't figure out a way to reconcile the need to protect our own environment and have a healthy economy that can support the way we want to live, then we're in trouble. We may need to stabilize the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere. And this is going to require action by everyone over a long period of time. Everyone has a role in this. As individuals, we can conserve energy. We can, we can turn off lights. We can use more energy efficient vehicles. As a society, we need to increase the use of renewable energy systems such as wind, biomass, and solar. We need to continue the improvement of the efficiency of energy systems that use fossil fuels as well. So we get more energy out of each ton of fossil fuel that we use. And we also need to stabilize the levels of CO2 in the atmosphere by storing the CO2 either at the Earth's surface or in deep underground reservoirs. This capture and storage process is called CO2 sequestration. The magnitude of greenhouse gases is extremely large, billions of tons of emissions. So essentially every option will be needed, but a key to carbon sequestration, the amount of storage potential is so large that sequestration will surely play a key role, if not bear the brunt of the burden. At the University of North Dakota, the Energy and Environmental Research Center is leading an international team to develop opportunities for CO2 sequestration in the heartland of North America. This program is one of seven regional sequestration partnerships developed for the Department of Energy's National Energy Technology Laboratory. The Plain CO2 Reduction Partnership is part of the U.S. Department of Energy's program to look at sequestration options in different regions of the country. Our partnership is focusing on the Northern Great Plains and we're looking at two long-term storage options, terrestrial sequestration and geologic sequestration. Terrestrial sequestration takes advantage of the natural ability of plants to remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and store it as solid carbon. This CO2 may have come from an auto or industry in another part of the world. Places that store CO2 over the long term are called sinks. Terrestrial is primarily biological sequestration and it's a real simple process. It involves uh, plants picking up carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, transferring it down to the soil via the root systems and it largely is incorporated in their roots. You're talking basic photosynthesis. It's something the plants have been doing forever. The carbon uh, that is taken up by photosynthesis is stored in the living tissues of the plant. It's in the form of organic carbon. Uh, it's also stored in the roots of plants, and that's actually one of the major uh, places that carbon is stored on the landscape in, in terrestrial sinks. Um, in the soils, 
we have all, the, all of the roots of the plants plus any undecomposed carbon, uh, plant tissues that are breaking down, but they haven't decomposed to the point where they've gone back to carbon dioxide, which is then re-released to the atmosphere. North America has four types of land cover that offer opportunities for terrestrial sequestration. They include forests, grasslands, farmed land, and wetlands. Forested areas store substantial quantities of carbon in the woody parts above ground and in the roots and soil below ground. In contrast, the CO2 taken in by plants in grasslands, farmed lands, and wetlands is stored mainly in the plant roots and in the soils. We're looking at how various land management and farming practices affect the amount of carbon that's taken up in soils and plant materials. One of our research partners, North Dakota State University, is studying carbon sequestration in both croplands and grasslands. Two of our research partners, the U.S. Geological Survey and Ducks Unlimited Canada, are teaming on a research project to determine how much carbon can be stored in wetlands and the surrounding soils using alternate management practices. The rate at which uh, carbon is stored in terrestrial systems varies by the type of habitat. In the upland habitat, where there is very little uh, water and that type of thing to reduce the oxygen, the rate is especially slow. In wetlands, where we have lots of water and reduced oxygen concentrations, the rate is very, very high. Our soils have lost as much as half of their natural carbon content through plowing since settlement began. The prairies are an area that were historically extremely rich in soil carbon. The prairies were an enormous carbon sink historically. The current land use of cultivation has oxidized that carbon in many cases and released a lot of it to the atmosphere. We therefore have great potential to put a lot of that carbon back in the, in the, uh, in the ground. That can be accomplished in several ways restoring wetlands and degraded lands, enrolling land in conservation programs, and minimum till, a farming technique that minimizes plowing, leaving crop litter on the ground and the roots in place. These practices limit the contact between oxygen and soil carbon. As a result, soil carbon is allowed to build up and far less carbon goes back into the atmosphere as CO2. Minimum till or no till, uh, Agriculture is very conducive to carbon storage. Uh, simply good rangeland management is, is good. There's tremendous benefits to the rest of society in terms of if you have a well-managed landscape, you have less soil erosion from wind and water. You have uh, just a, a variety of things that would accrue to society in general. This kind of sequestration is intended to be a stopgap solution. Uh, over the short term, in terms of climate change uh, as, a, as a method to allow industry time to develop technologies for reducing direct emissions to the atmosphere. Beyond the next several decades, geologic carbon sequestration offers much potential in addressing long-term measures for capturing and storing CO2 from human activities. Geologic sequestration involves the capture of CO2 from human sources before it's emitted into the atmosphere, and then the long-term storage of that CO2 in reservoirs deep underground. Geologic sequestration will work best with large stationary sources of CO2, like factories or power plants. Geologic sequestration of CO2 from these large stationary sources is a three-part process. First, the CO2 is separated from the exhaust and is purified or concentrated. Second, the CO2 is transported to the storage site. Finally, the CO2 is injected into an appropriate underground storage reservoir, which is then monitored. A handful of large-scale sources are already able to capture and concentrate CO2 from their processes, and they are able to sell that CO2. For example, several facilities provide food-grade CO2 that puts the fizz in soft drinks. But for most large-scale sources, Separating and concentrating the CO2 for sequestration using today's technology will be difficult and very expensive. In terms of power plant emissions, um, there really is no technology that we are aware of today that would allow the economical capture of CO2 from con current conventional power plant uh, designs. 
Uh, the problem is it's cost. Right now, best technologies available for CO2 capture at a power plant might increase the cost of electricity to the consumer by as much as 50%. The University of Regina and Sask Power are investigating capture and separation techniques using a small-scale unit attached to the Boundary Dam power plant at Estevan, Saskatchewan. Their results could help reduce the cost of CO2 separation in the future. Once the CO2 is captured and concentrated, it would be transported to the storage site. For the past 30 years, it has been safely transported by pipeline, just like natural gas and petroleum. When the CO2 arrives at the sequestration site, the final step of the process begins. Most CO2 storage sites would be deep underground. Suitable candidates include unminable coal beds, depleted oil and gas reservoirs, and saline reservoirs, which contain undrinkable water. These types of geologic reservoirs are found across North America and usually occur in areas with large stationary sources of CO2. The storage reservoir must form a container. It must be composed of a layer of porous rock with a seal on top to hold the CO2 in place. Geologic sequestration is a new twist on a proven oil field practice called enhanced oil recovery or CO2 flooding. CO2 flooding involves injecting CO2 underground into an oil reservoir to increase production. Every year, 34 million tons of CO2 are safely injected into underground oil producing zones, mainly in West Texas, to help extract more oil. The petroleum industry has been using uh, a form of sequestration for a number of years, and that is enhanced oil recovery, where they pump CO2 into the underground geologic formation in order to push more petroleum out of the ground. CO2 flooding is the process of using CO2 and using it in this oil field to enhance the oil recovery. You might hear the flood uh, referred to at times as a miscible flood and that's the chemical properties of the CO2 and the oil. They get along very well and it will actually mix with the oil and swell the oil and pop it out of the pores. Although not designed as a CO2 sequestration project, the Dakota Gasification and Ankana Oil CO2 Flood Project can teach us much about future sequestration options. The process starts at Dakota Gasification's Great Plains Sinfuel Plant in Beulah, North Dakota, and ends at the Weyburn Oil Field in Saskatchewan, operated by Ankana Oil. Dakota Gasification chemically converts coal into synthetic natural gas and numerous other byproducts, including CO2, which we sell to Canada for enhanced oil recovery. The, uh, the CO2 is captured at uh, Dakota Gasification's plant in Beulah, North Dakota. They compress it to very high pressure and it comes here through a pipeline. At the oil field, CO2 is injected into the oil formation where it makes the oil flow to the producing well. Some of the injected CO2 comes up the well with the oil. It is captured, separated from the oil, and re-injected. The sequestration twist on CO2 flood is that we want to end up with the CO2 permanently stored in the depleted oil reservoir. The Plain CO2 Reduction Partnership has joined an ongoing international project to use a successful CO2 flood operation to learn more about the potential for geologic sequestration. Because the Weyburn oil field has a successful CO2 flood operation and meets the criteria for a good geologic sequestration site, it is being used as a real-world laboratory to understand the best way to choose, operate, and monitor a long-term CO2 storage site. We were able to, to piggyback a major research project onto a commercial project. We want to be able to demonstrate with very good science that uh, the process is safe and, uh, and is not going to cause problems now or in the future. We put together a program that is effective in terms of understanding what's happening to the carbon dioxide and ensuring minimum risk of leakage. And, and if there does happen to be leakage, then we have a strategy in place for, for dealing with, uh, with those issues. The Weyburn operation is a model for the concept of value-added geologic sequestration, 
where CO2 helps produce extra oil at the beginning of the process and is put in permanent storage at the end. Value-added geologic storage means the cost of sequestration, like new equipment and monitoring activities, could be covered in part by the profit made possible by using the CO2 to pull additional oil or natural gas from reservoirs. Without the CO2 flood, uh, we would be um, winding down in 10 or so years and reaching the economic limit of the water flood. With the CO2 flood, it's extended the life of the field by 25 years, so the, the incremental barrels that are recovered during that process will hopefully pay for that additional capital. Extending the life of existing oil fields reduces the need to open new oil fields. The commercial enhanced oil recovery operation at Weyburn will add 180 million barrels of oil and an additional 25 years of life to units in one of the region's largest oil fields. But there are also benefits for the CO2 supplier, Dakota Gasification, at the other end of the CO2 pipeline in North Dakota. CO2 production in, at uh, Dakota Gasification provides us with a, a monthly profit of one to $1.5 million. So it's a very important part of keeping Dakota Gasification a viable part of this community and the state. The CO2 is natural part of our process, so selling it to, to a customer as a, as a byproduct is nothing but a win-win situation for us because it would have just been released. The regional sequestration partnerships are identifying other opportunities for CO2 sequestration across the U.S. and Canada. The result of the Weyburn project and other research activities will serve as the basis for future technology deployment projects. These demonstrations would give the opportunity to try out CO2 management strategies. One strategy in the planning stage combines coal gasification with geologic sequestration. This approach is called FutureGen. FutureGen is one of the most exciting projects that the department is funding today. FutureGen, when successful, and the timeline for this is about 10 years, would be the first coal-burning power plant that would both produce hydrogen for transportation use, electricity for residential and industrial use, and be zero-emitting, both zero-emitting for conventional pollutants and zero-emitting for CO2. The development of a commodity exchange market in carbon storage is adding significant interest and value to the carbon sequestration efforts by industries around the globe. This growing market serves as a carrot to develop the storage capacity needed to help make geologic and terrestrial sequestration a reality. Geologic and terrestrial sequestration offer the potential to control CO2 emissions and stabilize CO2 at an acceptable level in the atmosphere. The Plain CO2 Reduction Partnership, among others, is developing the answers to managing carbon dioxide in North America. But the issue goes beyond sequestration and beyond our borders. The problem of global warming is a global problem, and everybody knows that as we deal with this problem over the next few decades, over this coming century, because it's going to take that long, all countries are going to have to make emission reductions. But we also know that it's the industrialized countries, the U.S. included, that have the technological capacity and the economic capacity and really should be providing the world leadership in the short term now to begin putting in place the solutions that we know can address the problems. Managing CO2, whether through sequestration or advanced energy systems, has to be practical and affordable. If it's not, it certainly won't be used by us, and it won't be adopted by the developing nations that are going to experience the greatest growth in energy demand over the coming century. Revamping the world energy sector won't happen by chance, but we've already begun to lay the groundwork to manage carbon dioxide emissions. Carbon commodity markets like the Chicago Climate Exchange are being developed and tested. Scientists are researching CO2 capture technologies, storage options, and high-efficiency power systems. And the National Energy Technology Laboratory's regional carbon sequestration partnerships are working out a mix of practical and environmentally sound sequestration initiatives, region by region. People are generally aware that we've got an issue with climate change. I don't think people appreciate 
the amount of energy that we consume here today and the amount of energy that the world needs over the next century to maintain our standard of living and improve the standard of living for people in developing countries. So I would encourage people to become more aware, visit our website at energy.gov, contact the members of the partnership in their area and really learn about this issue and all the things that we need to do to make this vision a reality. Science has to be in the forefront of this debate, this discussion, to provide the solutions uh, globally. The challenge facing us is a global population that's going to increase by 1.5 billion in the next 15 years. And uh, demand, if you will, for all the conveniences of life that some of the rest of us have become accustomed to in the last 100, 150 years. So there will be more and more em emissions of CO2. How do we capture it? What can we do with it in order to find the balance and uh, be able to use those resources in a, a sensible way without damaging our environment. PCOR stands for the Plain CO2 Reduction Partnership. The partnership is a very real partnership which involves corporate and uh, governmental partners from a wide range of uh, expertise. What we're, we're proposing here could be replicated throughout the world, which would mean significant enhancement of energy resources, at the same time, significant sequestration of CO2 in many settings globally. Funding provided by the U.S. Department of Energy, the National Energy Technology Laboratory, members of the Energy and Environmental Research Center's Plain CO2 Reduction Partnership, and the members of Prairie Public.